Welcome to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Welcome back to A Fork in Time, the Alternate History Podcast. Don sitting in the host chair today and saying thank you for joining us. Uh, on today's episode, we're going to look at an introduction to what I think is actually probably going to be a series of episodes over time. We may just get it started only today. I want to look at the implications of an alternate timeline where we have either a delayed or a different discovery of the New World other than the famed 1492 Columbus sailing the ocean blue. And so on today's episode of A Fork in Time, we're going to look at at least the first of probably several scenarios that we'll look at scattered over multiple episodes over the coming months that specifically focus on what would have happened if that, that particular voyage of discovery in 1492-1493 had not been successful and how that would have altered Perhaps not only the uh, course of history in the New World, but would have also altered the course of history in Europe. Uh, so when we come back after the break here, we hope that you, uh, you join us for an exploration of beginning to look at what would have happened if the 1492 Columbus discovery had turned out a little bit different. We'll be right back. Alexis and Don taking just a quick break from the podcast here. Normally this is where we would have an ad or a, a, a mention. I think that's the, the inside term that we're supposed to. Brand mention is what they're called, at least on the website when we're, when we're loading an episode. But today I'm just going to directly appeal for one of the other ways that you can help the podcast where you may not get as much directly back in return as we do from the others, but still something that's important. So Alexis, what is Patreon? So Patreon is a platform where actually you can go and support the podcast that you love, including A Fork in Time. Yeah, and it's not just podcasts there. Patreon is probably the number one um, platform for artists and, and folks who have various things to be supported on. So podcasts frequently are there, but it can be YouTube channels. It can be the other things that are there. But basically it's your opportunity to become a subscriber or a, uh, a patron, hence Patreon, uh, for the show. So here at A Fork in Time, uh, we do have a few patrons, and we appreciate them. It doesn't cost a tremendous amount of money uh, to put on a podcast, but it does cost money. And so over time, one of the ways that you can help us defray the cost of the podcast, we've been able to use some of the money to upgrade the equipment that we use. Hopefully you notice that from time to time, is actually by supporting us on Patreon. So Alexis, how do you? how does someone find how to support us on Patreon? Just go to the link in the show notes. You'll see a Patreon link and click on that and you'll get all set up. Yeah, the other place you can go is actually to our website, which is www.aforkintimepodcast.com. There's a Patreon link there, as well as other non-monetary ways that you can support the show. Uh, Alexis and I have said this a number of times. We did not start a podcast to retire on. Uh, It's not that lucrative, particularly not a niche podcast about alternate Alternate history. history. Uh, but but still there are costs in doing that. So if you can help us out either through financial or non-financial means, we certainly would appreciate it. And we appreciate, again, the fact that we have built a global audience of what we think of as being our little community. And so we invite you to be a part of that. Anything else you want to say about that, Lex? Just thank you. Thank you. We appreciate it. Welcome back to A Fork in Time. Don joining you as the host today of our show. As we talked about a little before the break, going to be beginning a probably a series of episodes. They won't be back to back, but certainly a theme that we'll see running over the next couple of months. We're going to be looking at how things would have turned out differently by changing the course of history in the latter part of the 15th century, the very late part of the 15th century, in fact, the last decade. We all know the famous adage, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, which in our point of departure here is still going to be true. Columbus is still going to depart in the latter part of 1492, intent on finding a trade route to the riches, the spice riches of the east by sailing west. And of course, uh, in in the real timeline, he discovers there's this whole continent that lies in between the two. He had sort of misjudged the distance quite considerably. Uh, We're still going to have him set sail, but what we're going to do is we're going to have him not return. And so instead of 
having a successful voyage of exploration, voyage of discovery, which leads in the identification by Columbus of an entirely new continent. Although originally he uh, was, I think, still tried to be convinced that he had actually made it to where he thought he was going and not this intervening continent in between. Uh, but instead of that being reported back as it was in the real timeline in early 1493, we're going to have the situation where there is no awareness that Columbus had found anything because he never makes it back. And so we're going to have a situation here where the discovery of the new world, and I use the term discovery there loosely, as we all know, uh, see previous episodes and other conversations about the Norse influence, uh, China, in the new world, this idea that Columbus discovered the new world, of course, being a little bit of a misnomer. But we're going to have the situation where that is not the timing in which uh, particularly the European powers become aware that there is, in fact, a whole other continent <laughs> that exists between, if you sail west, between where they are and eventually arriving in territories that they knew, uh, which were the eastern parts of Asia uh, that were prized because of the trading opportunities that exist there with the spice. For me, the analogy that I want to set, which sort of sets the groundwork for this and how it's going to be so important at looking at several of the different alternate timelines, is sort of look at uh, a comparison that at least works in my mind. I hope that it makes sense to you. Thinking back to the 1960s, we had what was known as the space race. This was the competition between the United States and the Soviet Union in the early days of space exploration for milestones in terms of uh, putting a man to sp into space, doing various other things in space, but ultimately culminating in being able to actually make a voyage, another type of voyage of discovery, in this case actually what resulted in the Apollo moon landings in 1969, which was successfully sending and returning uh, uh, men to the moon and back. Now we call that the space race. I think an analogy that can be drawn here as we draw towards the latter part though, of the 15th century is there was a different type of race. It was the spice race. And uh, it had long been the case that there had been a trade, the Silk Road, which existed from Europe all the way over to China, had also, in addition to trading the valuable commodity of silk back and forth, uh, brought other spices and other uh, highly prized commodities back from Asia, from China, from India, uh, from the various uh, island nations, Indonesia, others uh, there in Asia uh, that were sought after by the various European powers. And so that the existence of that Silk Road, which ran through Italy and a great deal, deal was controlled by some of the, the, the Italian city-states, places like Venice uh, being an example of what's there, uh, the ability of uh, what we think of as modern-day Turkey uh, having some control over that, the other parts of that overland route uh, so well known because of Marco Polo and others. There was a tremendous effort going on, though, by those who weren't able to profit as much by the land trade uh, to actually open up that trade by sea. And that was most notably, uh, for the most part of the latter part of the 15th century, at the hands of uh, a successful Portugal. Uh, Prince Henry, known as Prince Henry the Navigator, the Portuguese sailors had begun the process of leapfrogging down the coast of Africa. And in fact, just a few, very few short years, about four years before 1488, in fact, before Columbus's voyage, Bartholomew Diaz had actually rounded the Cape of Good Hope, and now they weren't just going down the Atlantic coast of Africa, but they were now on the Indian Ocean side of the African coast, and it would be very soon, it wouldn't take very long at all, before there actually was a trade route that went via um, a, a route around Africa that the Portuguese uh, were controlling and had a tremendous amount of interest in uh, enabling the trade of spices and other goods coming back now by sea back from Asia back to Europe. Uh, this enters the situation here in 1492, an important year in European history also for a number of other reasons, but also most notably because it marks the end of Moorish influence on the Iberian continent. Uh, the, the end of what's called the Reconquista, where Spain now united under... Uh, the, the, the monarchy that's been brought together by Ferdinand and Isabella has completed Christian dominance of the peninsula and Spain as a combined power combining their two houses is growing to be more of the Spain that we'll know from history over the next couple of centuries. And so this is a critical juncture in history. 
And what we see in the middle of this critical juncture as Portugal uh, is coming to rise because of the, its success in terms of building this navigable uh, sea trade route to Asia and uh, what's going on with Spain united under Ferdinand and Isabella and their success at, at growing into a larger nation state is that Columbus's successful voyage, uh, although successful not in the ways that he originally intended it to, Columbus's successful voyage alters some of the geopolitics and the economics of Europe, particularly the relationships between Spain and Portugal. So what we're going to look at here is our first point of departure, and the point of departure that we will use pretty much for every other exploration of this is going to be what would have happened if Columbus had sailed but had never come back. And so there's no recognition, at least in 1492 and then early 1493, that there is a reason to sail west for success. Again, Columbus's original plan was to make it uh, via by sailing west to make it to the east, but there's no additional accidental discovery of a, of a new continent and the gold and the other riches that exist there that quickly become uh, the major uh, course of influence for Spanish activity in the early part of the 16th century and the way that that influences Spain's wealth and its position in Europe and all the things that flow from that. So again, we're going to eliminate a successful return for Columbus. This is not a hard thing to do. If you know anything about the history of Columbus's first voyage of exploration, there were a number of times that things could have gone wrong. Uh, they were not far uh, away from running out of supplies on the westward voyage when they finally found land there in the Bahamas. Uh, they encountered some of the native peoples and in a couple of instances had situations where there were clashes with the native peoples that resulted in the death. The largest of the three ships, the Santa Maria, actually runs aground at one point and eventually uh, gets transitioned into being used as raw materials for the first settlement that's established in the New World. The two smaller vessels, the Nina and the Pinta, are sailed back by Columbus and those of his crew that he did not leave behind to establish that first settlement. Uh, they encounter, as they're now sailing the Atlantic, back during the period of time that they're sailing, that they're sailing there, they encounter very rough seas, rough conditions, perhaps a tropical storm, perhaps a hurricane. Uh, probably not on that particular voyage, but they certainly, part of the voyage, but they could have encountered it otherwise, given the season that they were sailing in. And in fact, they barely make it back. One of the two ships makes it to the Azores uh, in uh, February. In fact, February the 13th of 1493 is a relevant date, about the time of the release of this episode, uh, when uh, a night at sea, when the two ships become separated, and the crews are such in fear of their life, they make a pact that if they survive over the next couple of days, the first thing they will do when they arrive back at land anywhere is immediately go to a chapel and, uh, and, and prayer, a, pray a prayer of thanks for their salvation from the situation of the, uh, of the uh, storm at sea that they've been cast out in. So you can imagine a scenario where Columbus and his, and his crew and his ships never successfully make it uh, to the Bahamas and to the New World while here... Uh, exploring in the New World, uh, they, they, they succumb to their demise, to their death, or on the way back, even after they've had a successful encounter with the natives of the New World and realizing that they had made, not the discovery they intended to make, but a discovery, they're never able to relay that discovery back to Spain. So the first point of departure that I want to explore actually is not going to focus on the New World, but going to focus on what the impact would have been in the Old World. As I've already mentioned, you have a little bit of a, the spice war that's going on here between Spain and Portugal. And so the first thing to note, I think that's an important departure under this scenario where there's not a successful um, exploration voyage by Columbus and what that brings back to the New World, is it changes the dynamics of that competition that's going on between Portugal and Spain. As I mentioned, it's just been four years before that Port Portugal has rounded the Cape of Good Hope. And literally, it's during the 10-year period of time, pretty much right there around Columbus's successful initial voyages, that Portugal really does sort of complete that transit, and they are able to open up that sea route uh, that goes from Europe over to uh, the various trade interests that exist in Asia. And so, without Spain having um, the wealth that is going to begin to become uh, in from the New World, the other things that are going to happen from their exploration and then some would argue their exploitation of the New World 
is you have not Spain on the rise as a result of what happens in our real timeline post-Columbus, but you have Spain pretty much where they were, and you have Portugal continuing its ascendancy. And so I think probably the most notable thing that would be a departure by changing uh, Columbus in 1492 is you would have seen a much more robust, a much more powerful, a much more influential uh, partner there on the Iberian Peninsula, not in the form of Spain, but in the form of Portugal. Uh, one of the things you might even consider is that in addition to establishing their trade route around Africa, uh, that Portugal uh, was building at that particular point of time. It's not uh, very far out of the possibility or the realm of possibility to consider that Portugal uh, may have actually been uh, the country that could have discovered the New World. In fact, what actually happened in 1500 was a Portuguese explorer, uh, Pedro Alvarez Cabral, actually landed in Brazil. He was not intending to sail west uh, to find, uh, to find uh, East Asia. He was actually just blown off course uh, in the fairly narrow uh, existence, relatively speaking, of what exists between Africa and South America and the South Atlantic. And so in making a trip down that would have been around Africa, they're actually blown further west and they actually discover Brazil by accident. And so while later Portuguese interest would exist in Brazil uh, in our regular timeline, you could have imagined a scenario where Portugal had, had founded and was beginning to exploit this sea route uh, going around Africa to Asia, but then also would have had the exploration and the discovery of the New World at the same time. Both of these happening without any Spanish involvement really in either of those things. And so there you have two reasons to imagine that Portugal could very much be in its ascendancy in lieu of Spain as we're accustomed in the real timeline. Of course, over the next century, in the real timeline of European politics, uh, we will see the events that are kicked off by the Reformation, and we will see the political struggles, the economic struggles that, that occur between the various powers in Europe, uh, France, between the, the newly united Spain, Portugal, England, um, the various German uh, principalities, the, Roman, Roman, the Holy Roman Emperor. We'll see all of this come in the context of religious conflict that comes during the Reformation uh, and the things that flow from that. Obviously, Spain plays an important role in that, and Spain being powered by gold and the riches and the resources that are coming from the New World helps to alter the balance of some of the political, the economic, and even ultimately because of that, the religious implications of what goes on during 16th century Europe. So again, imagining the scenario here where Portugal is the more ascendant of the two nations that are on the Iberian Peninsula, and Spain doesn't enjoy what we know in the real timeline, as I've already mentioned, the wealth and the other resources that are coming in from the New World, you would then have the ripple effect that carries itself across what is going on during the period of the Reformation, uh, the religious conflicts that happen during the 16th century, which are very important formative years about what's going on. Also, it can be argued that because of what goes on during that period of time, for example, the events that we've talked about very often on this podcast that relate to a Spanish princess being uh, married to not just one heir uh, to the English throne, but then ultimately being married to Henry VIII as the, as the king of England. So the relationship that exists between Spain and England uh, would be altered by the fact that Spain would not be as powerful an entity on the continent, again, without uh, Columbus's discovery and the benefits that come from the New World. You have this other thing that carries forth from there is the idea that England as a maritime power primarily exerts her, her influence as a sea power in the New World. Uh, and, of course, the awareness and the presence of the New World comes from uh, what goes on with the Spanish um, uh, influence that they are in England sa sailing over, becoming part of that, uh, becoming part of the colonization efforts. Again, depending upon how long it is before there's the realization of the existence of North and South America, really does play into what happens during the period there of the early uh, or the early 16th century, as uh, we have uh, colonization and exploration and other settlements that are going on. It might ultimately be argued. Uh, that perhaps Portugal actually becomes the discoverer of the New World, not by uh, the accident that happened in 1500, although that's certainly a possibility that I've already mentioned, but by just continuing their sailing exploits 
uh, which eventually led to Magellan's uh, circumnavigation of the world, coming around and discovering the New World, but discovering it from the West. Among the other potential changes that would actually happen in Europe as a result of there not being uh, the discovery or the, the realization of the New World in 1492 actually relates to perhaps what would have happened with the Italian city-states. Uh, certainly, as I mentioned before, because of the Silk Road and the power and the position, the geographic position that was enjoyed uh, by places like Venice, for example, the other uh, Italian city-states, their rise of their influence could have continued to have been stronger. In other words, there would have been less, uh, again, you, removing Spain as a growing power allows others to expand what they were doing there. So there may have been more Italian influence on the papacy. There may have been more Italian influence in trade because still the emphasis of the land side component that would be the complement to the Portuguese sea route component, allowing Italy, sort of the things that had uh, begun and were continuing through the Renaissance, to expand and to flourish further. You also might have seen a situation where a, a, a power like the Ottoman Empire uh, could have risen to even more prominence. Again, all of this relates back to in the absence of a powerful Spain. Important to remember the other key thing about 1492, it marks the end of the Reconquista. It marks the end of Muslim influence primarily on the European continent. Uh, but perhaps a weaker Spain uh, uh, without the, the wealth that's flowing in from the New World, becomes a divided Spain again. So the recently united kingdoms um, under Ferdinand and Isabella split back off into being separate kingdoms. Or you might have seen a scenario where there may have been a resurgence of Moorish influence or, the, the, again, the expansion of the Ottoman uh, influence and thus uh, a rise of Islam and even more of a push now coming from the East into Europe. So again... So much of the change in Europe, you see the theme here, uh, probably feel like I'm repeating myself, but I am, is that when you remove Spain as a, a nation on the rise because of the wealth and prestige that's coming from the New World, you allow other powers which had to take a second place or were pushed further back relative to Spain, you allow them uh, to either maintain prominence for longer or you allow them perhaps... Uh, to actually become more dominant moving forward. For example, would France have been a much larger player? It was already a large player in Europe in, in the 16th century. Would they have been a larger player, again, relative power and relative position to Spain? And so changing Columbus's voyage of discovery alters primarily the course of Spain. And once you begin to alter the course of Spain, uh, at this particular point in time, you begin to alter a lot of what happens in Europe over the next couple of centuries. It certainly also occurs to me to make uh, sure that we point out the connection that exists. Uh, if Chris Capola were here, he certainly would do it. About Spain, which had connections to the Habsburg family and the other elements of what uh, were Habsburg power existed in Europe. Uh, so, for example, the Habsburgs, uh, the, the sort of the northern branch, the German branch of the, um, of the Habsburg family was, was very important in slowing the expansion or the Ottoman influence into Central Europe. Uh, they were able to do that because of their strong relations with the other part of the Habsburg house uh, centered in Spain. And again, they were able to do that because Spain had the wealth of the New World that was coming in to do that. And so that's one of the ways that, again, tying back to this concept of whether Spain is ascending or descending becomes an important part in understanding the counterbalance of what's going on throughout Europe. The other place that there's a, sort of a European influence, and without going into this being a separate podcast episode to talk about, would be that of Africa. Uh, Portugal had quite a number of ports and uh, colonial possessions uh, that they that came to be of import for them because of their exploration around Africa. And so with no Americas to compete uh, with where exploration, discovery, and other uh, um, expansion by the European powers would go, it's easy to see that there would have been even more of a push for colonial expansion out of Europe into Africa. And so I think you very likely could have seen a very different way that Africa would have developed over time, particularly in the near term here, partly because Portugal and the influence that was coming from their, their touches there in Africa, but also because 
anything that was directed towards the New World in our real timeline could have instead been directed towards Africa in an altered timeline where there's not the recognition that a New World exists. And so you begin without Columbus's discovery in 1492 becoming apparent. You begin to have changes in Europe, and those changes in Europe will spill over into what's happening in Africa and really change a number of things moving forward. So, again, this is one of the first of several episodes that we'll sort of touch over probably the next couple of months about this concept of changing uh, Columbus's exploration in 1492 and the discovery that came from that. And we can easily see, without going into all of the detail yet, that there would have been changes in Europe. Those changes could have overflowed into Africa. In a future episode, we're going to come back and realize that also means there would have been changes to the timeline that we know it in North and South America because they don't have to contend with the arrival of European uh, colonizers, explorers, and conquerors and how things would have played out differently in the Americas when we revisit this topic of what if there had not been a reported discovery by Columbus in 1492. Hope you've enjoyed today's just really high-level overview uh, uh, episode here on a, on a Fork in Time as we look at this particular topic. Of course, this is what we do every week on the podcast as we look at uh, history from the eye of changing something and seeing how that would have rippled out through time. That's the whole concept behind alternate history, and we're glad that you found us. If you want to learn more about the podcast, more about us, we welcome a visit to our website. That's at www.aforkintimepodcast.com. There you can find out a little bit more about the podcast, get all of our back catalog of episodes, see ways that you can support and interact with the show, and we encourage you to do that. More than anything else, we want to thank you today for your time and for your attention. And until next week, when we come back, we uh, suggest that if you happen to find a fork in time, that you take it. Thanks. Thanks for listening to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Learn more about the podcast at www.aforkintimepodcast.com. Join us next time.